through the journeys of faith with these beloved children. In Christ's name, amen. Today, we begin with the first lesson, which is from the first letter of John. I never heard of the first letter of John before I was assigned to read it. It's very exciting. It reprises some of the ideas in the gospel according to John. So, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it. We declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and is revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with them while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus and Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not with us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not with us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The lesson the gospel lesson today um, is from John 20, verses 19 through 31, and is a wonderful story that complements the letter that I just read. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was the other twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he has said to, the, to them, Unless I see the mark, of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Here ends the lesson. Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, may the words I say be inspiring to others, giving them something to take from my message. Let us all learn from the words you have given us. Amen. So over the past few weeks in John, we've learned about the journey of Jesus and the disciples. We read of how they found belief and faith as they watched Jesus perform miracles. They listened to Jesus Jesus preach to thousands, feed the hungry, and save lost souls. Then they watched a horrible crucifixion with what I imagine were feelings of powerlessness, sadness, and despair. How lost and scared they must have been without their leader, their teacher, and their friend. Then last week, we heard the amazing story of when Mary learned that Jesus had rose from the dead. Christ is risen, the resurrection. She saw Jesus and was instructed to go tell the disciples where to be for a meeting. The same disciples that were in hiding for fear of something happening to them. Again, how confused and unsure of what to do they must have been. She tells them, I have seen the Lord. What do you think they were thinking at that time? After all, they had seen what had happened to Jesus. Did they believe her? Did they have faith that Jesus could do this? If Jesus had wanted to live, why not stop the crucifixion and all the pain it caused? How could one possibly come back to life? Well, they must have had some faith as they followed the directions Mary had given them. So when Jesus finally came to them a week later, he showed them his hands and his sides. Jesus was showing them that the resurrection was real. I wonder about emotions they could have been feeling then. Could they have been elated and shocked at the same time? Maybe a little disbelief mixed with hope. Their leader was back, and Christ greeted them with, Peace be with you. Then went on to say, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So Christ is reminding them to have faith, faith in the Holy Spirit, but also letting them know that they would need to continue the message of God on their own. But as we learned, one disciple was not with them, Thomas. I don't know where he was. It doesn't really, it's not really clear on that. But when the rest saw Thomas, they said, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas, sometimes referred to as doubting Thomas, replies, Unless I see the marks on his hands of the nails and place my fingers into the marks and place my hands on his side, I will never believe. Maybe they try and convince him that they had seen the Lord. But what they may have forgotten is that they may have doubted Mary as well. I wonder the effect on the relationship between Thomas and the disciples was during that time that he disbelieved them. But he did remain with them during that week that passed before he saw Jesus. So that could indicate that they did understand his need for proof. Thomas was searching for faith, not just accepting what others had told him. Now let's think about that. Why would that be? After all, the rest claimed that they had seen the Lord. But Thomas seemed insistent that he wouldn't just believe them, but he would never believe. 
Now, this seems normal to me. If a group of my friends tell me they had, they had seen something that I believed was impossible, I may have my doubts as well. So here's an example of doubt that happened years ago. I have a friend who yesterday went through the Panama Canal. She sent us pictures the entire time. I think it was just to make all the rest of us jealous and to encourage us that we needed a girl's trip. I voted yes. So when I thought about it, can you imagine what people first thought of this idea when someone proposed it? Let's make a passage over land for ships to go through. Land that has no clear path and has different altitudes. The French started this and then abandoned the project because most people said it was impossible. Then an American wanted to do it, but he wanted to get rid of the idea of digging to sea level. How else would ships get from one side of land to the other if we weren't at sea level? But then someone designed a lock system using gravity to complete the project and move ships over land. My friend did, pr did proudly point out it was a West Pointer who came up with the idea. She asked me to include that in the sermon today if I used your example. And the West Pointer finished the job. So I thought about that and I was thinking what faith that must have taken in the people that wanted to do that project. Faith that it could be done despite all the disbelief they had from multiple countries and people. But now back to Thomas. We then learn that Thomas gets his chance. Jesus sees Thomas a week later, and he also greets him with peace be with you, and tells Thomas to put his fingers on his sides. Jesus doesn't appear to be upset with Thomas, but offers him the proof he needed. Christ says, do not disbelieve, but believe. Then Thomas replies with, my Lord and my God. We'll come back to that one. Jesus had, very, had something very interesting to say about belief. He says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think these words must be a gift to us years later. It would be impossible for us to see what had happened, but he is saying that we can still believe. This makes me think about the difference between faith and belief. Did Thomas have faith but no belief? Or did he believe but have no faith? When we hear these words, we might think they're the same and even interchangeable. But if we dig deeper, we'll discover they're alike, but not identical. So let's start with the definitions of the two. Faith, that one dictionary defines it as complete trust or confidence in something or someone. A biblical definition is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. In other words, belief and trust God based on evidence but without total proof. That was faith. Now belief. An acceptance that a statement is true and that something exists considered to be true or held in an opinion. So a difference but small. Belief is acknowledging something is true but does not automatically translate into action. It can but there's no guarantee it will. So basically, you accept it to be true, but you might not do anything with it. So if you can believe in something, but not have faith. Faith is when we act on it. It's what steers us, what guides our actions and our words. So let's give a few examples to make it clear what the difference between faith and belief is. Most people believe you can jump out of an airplane with a parachute. You jump, pull the ripcord, a parachute opens and you land safely on ground. You can ask around and most people will accept this as true. However, it is faith that one needs to put the parachute on, jump from the plane, pull the cord, and then land safely. Not belief, but pure faith. I, for one, fall into the category of people that believe this is possible with all my being. In fact, my husband and several of his friends put on parachutes, jumped from a plane, pulled the cord, and landed safely. However, no belief that I have in this will give me the faith to jump out of an airplane with anything kind of parachute on. Another more recent example of belief in faith, when young children had faith that the Easter Bunny will come. He or she will hide eggs, leave some candy, maybe chew on a few carrots. They need no proof other than what they see in the morning. 
we as adults might even contribute to their belief. But I would challenge that that faith can continue. My teenagers may not believe, since they don't have proof in this furry animal, but they do have faith that on Easter morning, there will be hidden eggs and treats that I do not approve of. This faith gets them up earlier than normal on a weekend and even happy to be awake. Now some biblical examples. Noah built an ark by faith, even with no rain in his lifetime. Abraham left his family, not knowing where he was going, but having faith in God. Joseph had faith that God would bring the Israelites to the land promised to them by God, but had no proof. In these current and biblical examples of faith, what do they all have in common? When faith is present, the person or people's action demonstrates it. This, is this what James meant when he said, where there is faith, there will be actions, and your faith will be seen by what you do. So, how does your faith guide your actions? Do the readings from the last few weeks compel you to live any differently? Does the story of suffering of what Jesus did resonate with you? For me, I think that if Jesus can do this for me, what can I do differently? Well, I can assure you, I will still not have the faith to jump from an airplane. But I can live a life with more purpose, more kindness, and more compassion. Can I use my faith in God, in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to make this world, my community, my family, and myself better? If so, how? I'm sure I, as well as others, can come up with countless simple ways to make a difference. Now, a few other things I took from this week's readings. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Some say this is the only time in the gospel that Jesus is called God. Thomas doesn't say the Son of God, but refers to Jesus as God. I'll need to research it a bit more, but I did find it very interesting and compelling, and so I thought I'd point it out. Next, Jesus, who thought he had been, his body had been stolen, the disciples, who were frightened and in hiding, and Thomas, were all greeted with the phrase, peace be with you. This is not a greeting like, hi, how are you? Good afternoon. Nice to see you. This is more like a prayer and an expression of hope. Reassurance in their time of fear. This phrase can mean so many things to different people and depending on the situation. The Romans meant it as a time without conflict. The Hebrews used it for social justice. Earlier in John, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, the kind of peace the world cannot give. Could this also be Christ guiding the disciples and us to the Holy Spirit? What is the significance of us offering each other the sign of peace each Sunday? Is it a sign of hope, of love, of kindness? Or do, even we, do we even think about it since it's something we do and we just do it out of habit? Well, I would encourage you this Sunday to look into each other's eyes and really wish peace to each other. The story of Thomas can teach us about believing in things we cannot see, having faith, and most importantly, acting on that faith. If we want God's peace, we must find a way to believe and have faith. Jesus reminds us this in a blessing, to believe without proof. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we read about trusting the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. Think about him in all your ways, and he will guide you on the right path. We need to have faith and act on it. Finding peace in the world, with each other, with nature, and with ourselves. Blending our belief and faith into action, not just thinking about it. Let us pray. Lord, we want to know you and affirm that you, what you have said to us is true. Help us to demonstrate our faith by putting into action what you have said and taught us. Let our actions be the evidence that we believe in you and all that you say and you will do. Give us grace to start where we are and use our faith to grow in our love and knowledge of you. Let this faith be strong so we will see more of you in all aspects of our lives. Let us encourage others to also live a life in Christ. We thank you for your suffering you did for us 
and for the peace you and the Holy Spirit give us daily. In your name we pray, amen. Please join us in hymn 342 in your black hymnal. Thank <laughs> you. 